Good afternoon everyone, my name is Taslim Hassan and I will be presenting on the role of estrogen and progesterone in contraception. My supervisor was Dr. Norma Mbungu. During this talk, I will be focusing on the following topics, the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis, a brief overview into the menstrual cycle, estrogen, progesterone, Contraception, the MEC criteria, a brief overview of the various hormonal contraceptives available, and a brief discussion on contraceptive use in HIV. The hypothalamus regulates secretion of gonadotropins by the pituitary via the gonadotropin releasing hormone, that is GnRH. Once GnRH is stimulated and secreted by the hypothalamus, to the pituitary, it then binds to specific receptors which mediate the release of and control of LH and FSH secretion by the pituitary in a pulsatile fashion. LH and FSH is carried to the ovaries where they then stimulate the secretion and release of progesterone and estrogen. Progesterone and estrogen has a short feedback on the release of LH and FSH and a long feedback on GnRH release. Menstruation is the cyclic orderly sloughing of the uterine lining in response to the interaction of hormones produced by the hypothalamus, pituitary and ovaries. The menstrual cycle may be divided into two main phases, the follicular or proliferative phase and the luteal or secretory phase. The length of a menstrual cycle is the number of days between the first day of the menstrual bleeding of one cycle to the onset of menses of the next cycle. The median duration of a menstrual cycle is 28 days, with most cycle lengths between 25 to 30 days. The typical volume of blood lost during menstruation is approximately 30 ml. Any amount greater than 80 ml is considered abnormal. The menstrual cycle is typically most irregular around the extremes of reproductive life, that is menoc and menopause, due to anovulation and inadequate follicular development. Estrogen is a steroid hormone. It is the primary hormone secreted by the follicle in the ovaries. Natural estrogens, of which estradiol is the most active and potent form. It is secreted by the graphene follicles, the corpus luteum and the placenta in females and by aromatization of testosterone in the testes and extraglandular tissues in males. It maintains a healthy uterine lining for possible pregnancy during the reproductive years. Esterone is the oxidized form of estradiol E2 in the liver, which maintains a healthy, thin uterine lining during menopause. Estriol is formed by the hydroxylation of esterone. This maintains a healthy, thick uterine lining, which provides blood to the placenta during pregnancy. Estrogen is especially important for the development of female secondary sexual characteristics and its significance in various gynecological conditions. Synthetic estrogens are compounds obtained by the chemical synthesis that possess estrogenic activity. One such compound is ethanol estradiol. It is used alone or in combination with progestions as an oral contraceptive and some forms of menopausal hormonal therapy.
like all steroid hormones, estrogens readily Estrogen is responsible for the normal sexual maturation and growth of females. It stimulates the development of the vagina, uterus, fallopian tubes, and secondary sexual characteristics. It is responsible for the proliferation of the endometrial lining as well as enhancing sperm penetration. It stimulates stromal and ductal development in the breast, axillary, and pubic hair, as well as the typical feminine body contour. Estrogen decreases the resorption rate of bone via the apoptosis of osteoclasts. It results in water and salt resorption with subsequent hypertension in prolonged use. Glucose tolerance is impaired, especially in diabetics, which may lead to loss of HP control. It may even precipitate diabetes. It results in reduced plasma LDL cholesterol, increased HDL and triglyceride levels, as well as a raised HDL LDL ratio. Blood coagulability is increased due to induction of principles of clustering factors, namely factor 2, 7, 9, and 10. Fibrinolytic activity increases by the lowering of plasminogen activator inhibitor. Estrogen promotes endothelial derived nitric oxide production through increased expression and activity of endothelial nitric oxide synthase and modulates prostacycline and thromboxane A2 release. The thromboxane A2 pathway is the key to regulating the vascular tone in females. Estrogen levels vary among individuals. They also fluctuate during the menstrual cycle in over a female's lifetime. This fluctuation can sometimes produce effects such as mood changes before menstruation or hot flashes in menopause. Factors that can affect estrogen levels include pregnancy, puberty, menopause, obesity, extreme dieting, the use of certain medications including steroids and some congenital conditions such as Turner syndrome. Natural estrogens and synthetic estrogen may cause the following common adverse effects. Breast tenderness, nausea, vomiting, abdominal cramps, headaches, weight gain, hyperpigmentation of the skin, hair loss, vaginal itching, abnormal uterine bleeding, also known as a breakthrough bleed, and in rare cases, anaphylaxis. Weight gain may be a reported adverse effect of the oral contraceptive pill containing ethanol estradiol, but studies conducted on short-term and long-term use of oral contraceptives results in no weight gain association. More severe side effects of estrogen include hypertension, CVAs, myocardial infarction, venous thromboembolism, pulmonary embolism, exacerbation of asthma, vaginitis, vulvovaginal candidiasis, enlargement of uterine fibroids, and a risk of cervical cancer and breast cancer, which I will be touching on a bit later. Progesterone is sometimes called the hormone of pregnancy, pro meaning for and gesterone meaning gestation. It is a natural progesterone which is produced in response to LH in both females and males. It is also synthesized by the adrenal cortex. It is secreted from the corpus luteum in the latter half of the menstrual cycle under the influence of LH. Its production declines a few days before the next menstrual flow. Progesterone levels measured one week prior to expected menses can be used to assess ovulation. Typically, a level above 3 nanograms per ml indicates ovulation. Progesterone converts the endometrium to its secretory stage to prepare the uterus for implantation. At the same time, it affects the vaginal epithelium and cervical mucus, making it thick and impenetrable. Progesterone has been thought to exert its effects through the progesterone receptor, a member of the nuclear steroid hormone superfamily, and as such acts through specific progesterone response elements within the promoter region of target genes to regulate transcription of such genes. This has often been described as the genomic mechanism of progesterone action.
Rotation on decreases estrogen driven endometrial proliferation, leading to development of a secretory endometrium with the onset of menstruation. The endocervical gland secretion is turned to a scant viscid material, favoring sperm penetration. Progesterone is important for the maintenance of pregnancy by suppressing menstruation and uterine contractility. The development of the mammary gland requires both estrogen and progesterone. During pregnancy, acting with estrogen brings about the proliferation of the SNI of the mammary gland. Towards the end of the pregnancy, the SNI are filled with secretions and vasculature as the gland increases. After the levels of estrogen and progesterone decrease at parturition, so does lactation begin. Under the influence of progesterone, mitotic activity in the breast epithelium is very low in the follicular phase and then peaks in the luteal phase. During a normal menstrual cycle, increase in the basal body temperature of about 0.5 degrees Celsius mid-cycle correlates with ovulation. Progesterone also increases the ventilatory response of the respiratory center to CO2 and leads to reduced arterial alveolar PCO2 in the luteal phase of the menstrual cycle and during pregnancy. Progesterone may also have a depressive and hypnotic effect in the CNS, possibly accounting for drowsiness of the hormone administration. Progesterone increases basal insulin levels with the rise in insulin after carbohydrate ingestion. With long term administration of more potent progesterone, it reduces glucose tolerance. It also stimulates lipoprotein lipase activity and seems to enhance fat deposition. Progesterone and its analogues increase LDL with little or no reduction in plasma HDL levels. Long term progesterone use induces an unwanted increase of plasma LDL levels and reduce peripheral arterial flow-mediated dilatation, which are points of concern. Progesterone does not alter coagulation factors, nor increase blood pressure. Some studies have found an increased venous thromboembolism risk, but these studies have methodological weaknesses in a small number of cases. Nonetheless, the WHO has attributed category 23 to progesterone in women with current venous thromboembolism history of stroke or ischemic heart disease. The primary concern is the effect of progesterone on bone density. Progesterone suppresses endogenous estrogen production from the ovaries by its strong anti action. Compared to non-users, the bone mineral density at the hip and spine in progesterone users decreases by 3.5% after one year and up to 7.5% after two years of use. There is therefore concerns about the use of progesterone in adolescents where the accumulation of bone mass is at its peak and in premenopausal women as there may be an increased rate of bone density loss. However, many studies have shown that bone loss is reversible and the best evidence available at present indicates that progesterone does not reduce peak bone mass and does not increase the risk of osteoporotic fractures in later life, in, especially in women with an average risk of osteoporosis. At present, progesterone is contraindicated in breast cancer, active liver disease, benign and malignant tumors. Side effects include menstrual irregularities during the first three to six months with irregular bleeding and spotting, and later there may be amenorrhea in up to 75% of users. There may be weight gain of between 3 and 6 kilograms, especially in young obese women. Headache, abdominal discomfort and pain Dizziness and nervousness have also been described. The benefits include reduction of heavy menstrual bleeding due to the high incidence of amenorrhea after long use, a reduced risk of pelvic inflammatory disease, reduction of endometriosis pain, fewer painful crisis in women with sickle cell disease, and a reduction in vasomotor symptoms. So how do contraceptives work? The main mechanism of action is the prevention of ovulation by inhibiting follicular development. Progesterone negative feedback works at the hypothalamus to decrease the pulse frequency of gonadotropin-releasing hormone. This, in turn, will decrease the secretion of LH and FSH. If the follicle isn't developing, then there is no increase in the estradiol levels as the follicle makes estradiol. The progesterone negative feedback and lack of estrogen positive feedback on LH secretion 
will stop the mid-cycle LH surge. With no follicle developed, no LH surge release the follicle, there is the prevention of ovulation. Estrogen has some effect with inhibiting follicular development because of its negative feedback on the anterior pituitary, which slows FSH secretion. It's just not as prominent as the progesterone's effect. Another primary mechanism of action is progesterone's ability to inhibit sperm from penetrating through the cervix and upper genital tract by making the cervical mucus unfriendly. Progesterone-induced endometrial atrophy should deter implantation, but there is no proof that this occurs at this point. Clinical trials typically report their failure rates either by the pill index or life table analysis. The pill index is defined as the number of contraceptive failures per 100 women, years of exposure, and uses as the denominator. The total months or cycles of exposure from the initiation of the product to the end of the study or the discontinuation of the product. The life table analysis, on the other hand, provides the contraceptive failure rates for each month of use and can provide a cumulative failure rate for any specific length of exposure. that women may consider when they decide which contraceptive method to use are as follows. How safe and effective the method will be, whether the method meets a desire for short-term, long-term or permanent protection, possible side effects of the method, how easy it will be to use, whether the method is affordable, access to resupply is easy. Age, postpartum and breastfeeding play a role in the decision as well. It is important to note that more than half of women of reproductive age in developing countries are in need of contraceptives, of which 1.5 billion women of reproductive age. 57% have been seen to be in need of contraception, of which 42% are currently using a modern method of contraception. It is also important to point out that 13% of women aged between 15 to 19 years become pregnant voluntarily or not each year a ratio that has not changed statistically since the 1970s. Approximately 85% of the above-mentioned pregnancies are unintended. This basically shows that 80 million unintended pregnancies occur yearly, of which 67 million are amongst those that were with the unmet need for contraception. As depicted in this chart, the contraceptive failure can occur with any method. However, some methods are more effective than others. The slide shows pregnancy rates for various contraceptive methods. The grey rectangle shows pregnancy rates for perfect use, reflecting how often a contraceptive method fails when it is used both correctly and consistently. The black blue rectangles show pregnancy rates for typical use, which reflects how often a contraceptive method fails in real-life situations, when it may not always be correctly and consistently used. Typical use rates vary amongst user characteristics, user behavior, and the adequacy of counseling and access to resupply. The pill is a user-dependent method. Its failure rate differs between perfect use by women who take it every day at the same time, and typical use when the pill is used inconsistently or incorrectly. This illustration provides a method for sharing information on contraceptive method effectiveness with patients. Patients tend to find this depiction of method effectiveness easy to understand. Given the importance of method effectiveness as a factor in patients' decision making about contraceptives, it may be helpful to use an aid like this when counseling patients about possible methods. The medical eligibility criteria for contraceptives is an evidence-based recommendation with periodic expert reviews. The fourth edition was published in 2009 with recommendations for the use of specific contraceptive use by women who have particular characteristics or medical conditions. The recent updates since 2009 include the recommendations for women at high risk of or living with HIV, the recommendations for use of combined hormonal contraceptive use for postpartum women, and the recommendations for use of progesterone-only contraceptives 
amongst breastfeeding women. This document provides guidance on the safety of 19 contraceptive methods for women and men with specific characteristics or known medical conditions. These conditions range from age, smoking, parity, to cardiovascular disease, cancer and infections. This is a depiction of the MEC chart as adapted according to the WHO. It is recommended to use as a guideline for choosing a method to ensure correct, efficient utilization of contraceptives with consideration of the above criteria and risk profile of your patient. The criteria organized according to contraceptive method, patient characteristics and pre-existing conditions. The criteria use a numeric scheme to provide the recommendations for contraceptives being used for contraceptive purposes only and not to be used as treatment of medical conditions. The categories are as follows. Number one is a con make one is a condition for which there is no restriction for the use of the contraceptive method. Two is a condition where the advantages of using the method outweighs the theoretical or proven risks. Three is a condition where the theoretical or proven risks will outweigh the advantages of using the method. And four, a condition which represents an unacceptable health risk if the contraceptive method is used. The following conditions pose an increased risk for adverse health events as a result of unintended pregnancy. And these patients should consider long-acting, highly effective contraceptive use. Currently, patients with breast cancer, complicated vulvular heart disease, diabetes, which is insulin dependent, or of more than 20 years duration with end organ damage, endometrial or ovarian CA, sickle cell disease, epilepsy, SLE and malignant gestational trophoblastic disease. The following hormonal methods are available either as combined or progestion only. Combined hormonal contraceptive is also available as a patch, a vaginal ring and as an injectable. Progestions are available as injectables, pills, the implant as well as the IUD. The combined pill, which is a combination of estrogen and progesterone, formulations may be divided into the following. A monophasic formulation where each tablet contains a fixed amount of estrogen and progesterone, example Yasmin and Nodet, where you have the active tablet for 21 days and a 7-day placebo. The biphasic tablet where each tablet contains a fixed amount of estrogen while the amount of progesterone increases in the second half of the cycle, usually on day 1 to 10 or 11 to 21. Such an example is Maset. Triphasic is the amount of estrogen may be fixed or variable while the amount of progestion increases in three equal phases every seven days. Such an example is triphasal. Quadrophasics will stimulate a more natural cycle with reduced side effects like natasia. Basic pills are particularly recommended for women over the age of 35 and for those with no withdrawal bleeding. Started on the first day of the menses and continues for 21 days, followed by 7 days of a withdrawal bleed to allow for menses. It is important to note that the effect of combined oral contraceptives occur after 2-4 to four hours after the dose is taken and the effect diminishes at 22 hours and it's virtually non-existent at 24 hours. Therefore, the pill must be taken daily at the exactly the same time. If you are more than 3 hours late, you need to use a backup method for at least 48 hours. When choosing a contraceptive regime, patient preference should be strongly considered. Generic formulations cost less than brand name formulations and are bioequivalent. With 21 days of active and 7 days of inactive pills to mimic the menstrual cycle. Some formulations contain the 24 active and 4 inactive pills, which is 24-4, which may reduce the chance of contraceptive failure, breakthrough ovulation. Extended pill taking regimes are used by many women to delay or avoid a withdrawal bleed. This is most easily achieved with a monophasic regime in which each active pill contains the same amount of estrogen and progesterone and the inactive pills are stacked. Typically, this is done for three months at a time. Monophasic regimes are preferred. The root of oral contraceptives differ. Um, it can be used orally, transdermal as a patch or as a vaginal ring.
As I've discussed before, um, estrogen inhibits the secretion of FSH via the negative feedback on the anterior pituitary, thus suppressing the development of the ovarian follicle. The progesterone also inhibits LH release and thickens the cervical mucus, thus impeding the transport of sperm. They act in concert to alter the endometrium in such a way as to discourage implantation. They may also interfere with the coordinated contractions of the cervix, uterus and fallopian tube that facilitate fertilization and implantation. Ethanol estradiol is used in most combined oral contraceptive pills. The types of projections can be divided into natural and synthetic projections. The most common being medoxyprogesterone, which can be taken orally or IM every one to three months. Levonorgestrel and desogestrel is less androgenic. The progestion only pill contains only progestion and are taken on a continuous schedule. It contains no ethadrone and no gestrel. Progesterone alone can inhibit ovulation in 40% of cycles and thicken cervical mucosa that impedes sperm penetration. It is useful for women with contraindications to estrogen and postpartum women who are breastfeeding. It does, however, have a higher pregnancy rate than combination oral contraceptive pills and are more sensitive to missed pills than combination pills. It is also associated with abnormal bleeding and other side effects. On the other hand, the implant has a pill index of 0.38 pregnancies per 100 women years of use. It contains progestion such as levonorgestrel, either 216 mg in the 5-year regime or 150 mg in the 3-year, which is the implant, of which it contains 75 mg per rod. It primarily acts by suppressing the GnRH pulse and inhibiting ovulation. It is important to note that accurate placement is crucial to the product's reliability and the concentration falls over time, a rate that is dependent on the body weight. Clinical experience with implanon in women weighing more than 80 kg is however limited. The injectable contraceptive hinders the need for daily ingestion of pills. They are given IM as a depot medoxyprogesterone acetate, 150 mg at 3 monthly intervals. After the IM injection, the peak blood levels are reached in 3 weeks and decline with a T half of 50 days. The dose is a standard dose and no adjustment is necessary for body weight. There is no reduction in efficacy with concurrent medication. On the other hand, the intrauterine Mirena device contains levonorgestrel, which is effective for up to five years and it acts by primarily producing uterine changes, cervical mucus thickening and producing a hostile endometrium. It can also be used to treat endometriosis. These are useful when estrogen should be avoided by decreasing the risk of endometrial cancer. However, it does give irregular bleeding and amenorrhea in 75% of patients. Common side effects are weight gain of up to 6 kgs in young obese females. Abdominal pain and depression are common side effects as well. Prolonged use may decrease bone mass. Concerns about the use of depot progesterone in adolescents when the accumulation of bone mass is at its peak, but studies have shown as I've proven earlier. Estrogen preparations come in the form of either oral tablet an intramuscular injection, a vaginal ring, a topical cream, a topical spray, vaginal cream, and transdermal patches. The transdermal patches has an advantage in that it has milder systemic side effects, it avoids hepatic delivery, thyroid binding globulin, cortisol binding globulin, and angiotensin and clotting factors are not raised, therefore the risk of thromboembolic phenomena are avoided, and the effect of serum lipid profile is less marked. These are the common side effects associated with the combined oral contraceptive pill and how to manage each side effect. For example, a patient that comes in with nausea, you can use a pill that has a reduced estrogen dose, exclude pregnancy, they can take the pill at night or change to a progesterone only method. Breast tenderness can be avoided by reducing estrogen with a progesterone dose, changing to a progesterone only method or consider using a pill containing drosperinone. Bloating and fluid retention can be avoided by reducing the estrogen dose or changing to a progesterone only with a mild diuretic effect like drosperinone. 
Headaches can be avoided by reducing estrogen dose or changing to progesterone only pill. If the headache does occur in the hormone free week, consider extended use or giving estradiol 50 micrograms transdermal patch in this week or trying natasia. The extended, extended pill regime can be used to reduce the frequency of bleeding. No evidence supports a benefit of one type of oral contraceptive over the another in a patient with reduced libido. And in breakthrough bleeding, if you are taking ethanol estradiol, 20 milligram pill, increase the estrogen dose to a maximum of 35 micrograms or change the progesterone if already taking an ethanol estradiol of 35 micrograms pill. Or try another form of contraception or consider the vaginal ring. The indications for emergency contraception are um, if you had an oopsie where no contraceptive was used, the condom broke or slipped, if you missed two or more days of your combined oral contraceptive pill, it is highly effective up to 75% and it can be used up to 120 hours after unprotected sexual intercourse. Emergency contraceptives have two regimes available. Periodic regime contains two doses of ethanol estradiol, which is administered 12 hours apart. The first dose taken within 120 hours of unprotected sexual intercourse. It prevents approximately 75% of unintended pregnancies, but does have a high rate of side effects due to the high estrogen component with a high rate of nausea and vomiting, which may limit adherence. The progestion only pill has advantages in that it is more effective and better tolerated than the YASPI regime. It may be taken as a single dose and may be preferable for women with a history of idiopathic thrombosis. It is associated with a moderate degree of side effects, including nausea, vomiting, dizziness, and fatigue. Plan B would be to take levonorgestrel either as a single dose of 1.5 mg or two divided doses of 0.75 mg. 12 to 4 hours apart with the first dose administered within 120 hours and an antiemetic taken an hour before the first dose. Estrol is the ideal estrogen of choice for combined oral contraceptive pill as it's safe for cardiovascular complications and history of breast cancer. Ornabel is a new contraceptive vaginal ring with different polymers than the existing contraceptive ring which allows for a more stable and gradual release of both hormones, thus avoiding the undesirable burst effects of ethanol estradiol. Studies have been published describing the efficacy and special advantages of a new progesterone only pill containing drospirinone in a prospective multicenter trial at in 41 European sites in healthy women. They were given 4 mg of drospirinone daily for 24 days, followed by placebo for 4 days. The overall bleeding profile improved considerably and they could also show that despite the four-day hormone-free period and a multiple unintentional 24-hour delays in tablet intake, ovulation inhibition was maintained. The combined oral contraceptive pill has been used to alleviate signs of hyperandrogenism by suppressing androgen synthesis, reducing LH, inducing sex hormone binding globulin, thus resulting in a reduced free androgen levels with a negative feedback on the sebaceous glands with improved acne formation. It's commonly used in teenagers, of which jasmine has been used. It is also shown to have a 50% reduction in dysmenorrhea and abnormal uterine bleeding. The RCOG recommends the pill to be used to reduce pains and size of lesions prior to surgery for endometriosis, of which oral design has been registered for its use. A recent case control study comparing BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation cases with controls showed that the combined oral contraceptive pill prevented ovarian CA in this high risk group. It has also been shown to have reduction risks of endometrial cancer, pelvic inflammatory disease, osteoporosis, and osteopenia. Contraception after childbirth is a very important health issue and the evidence supports increasing birth intervals to improve both a woman's and a child's health needs. Amongst the contraceptive choices in the postpartum period are hormonal methods, being combined methods which contains estrogen and progesterone and progesterone-only methods. 
Recommendations with regard to the use of progesterone-only contraception amongst postpartum women who are breastfeeding. The use of progesterone-only methods with exception of the levonorgestrel-bearing IUD is not usually recommended for women who are less than six weeks postpartum and breastfeeding unless other more appropriate methods are unavailable or unacceptable. Beyond six weeks postpartum, there is no restriction for the use of the progesterone-only contraceptive method amongst breastfeeding women. The levonorgestrel-bearing IUD is not usually recommended for the first four weeks postpartum unless other more appropriate methods are available. Beyond four weeks postpartum, there is no restriction for its use. Clinical studies have demonstrated conflicting results regarding the effects of milk volume in women exposed to combined oral contraceptive pills during lactation. However, no consistent effects on the infant weight have been reported. Adverse health outcomes or manifestations of exogenous estrogen in infants exposed to combined contraceptives through breast milk have not been demonstrated. However, studies have been inadequately designed to determine whether a risk of either serious or subtle long-term effects exists. Therefore, the combined oral contraceptive pill has been categorized as a MEC-3 according to the WHO criteria for postpartum breastfeeding women. The progesterone-only contraceptive has been categorized as a MEC-3 in patients that are less than six weeks postpartum as there is a concern that the neonate may be at risk of exposure to steroid hormones. However, in many settings, pregnancy, morbidity and mortality risks are high and access to services is limited. In such settings, the progesterone-only contraceptive may be used as one, if it is only one of the few types available and accessible to breastfeeding women immediately postpartum. The direct evidence from clinical studies demonstrates that there is no effect of the progesterone-only contraception on breastfeeding performance and generally demonstrates no harmful effects from exposure through breast milk in infants less than six weeks of age. However, these studies have been inadequately designed to determine whether there is a risk of either serious or subtle long-term effects. What increased risk is posed by the use of combined oral contraceptive pills? No specific data delineates the risk of combined oral contraceptive use during the postpartum period. The baseline risk of venous thromboembolism in a non-pregnant, non-postpartum woman is 2.4 to 10 with every 10,000 patients. The combined oral contraceptive pill <coughs> use increases the risk by 3 to 7 fold, but the risk is most pronounced in the first year of use. It depends on the amount of estrogen and the type of progesterone used. The third generation progesterones has a higher risk of venous thromboembolism than the first and second generation use. Estrogen alters the liver metabolism and lipoproteins. It increases the fibrinogen, plasminogen, factors 7, 9, 10 and 13. It reduces plasminogen activator inhibitor. Therefore, it increases the risk by venous, of venous thromboembolism by a shift in the favor of clot formation and the prevention of clot dissolution. According to the Cochrane Review in 2010, 20 micrograms of ethanol estradiol has a lower venous thromboembolism risk. They therefore recommended that 30 micrograms of ethanol estradiol be used as a first-line combined oral contraceptive with LNG, with no antiandrogenic effects for its lower risk of venous thromboembolism. The combined oral contraceptive use for women during the postpartum period, less than 21 days without other risk factors for venous thromboembolism, is a MEC3. With other risk factors for venous thromboembolism, is a MEC3 or 4, and this category should be assessed according to the number, severity, and combination of risk factors present. After 21 days, up until 42 days, without the risk of venous thromboembolism, it is a MEC2. With other risk factors for venous thromboembolism, it's a MEC2 or 3, which should also be assessed according to the number, severity, and combination of risk factors for venous thromboembolism. After 42 days, it is categorized as a MEC1. The 
The WHO has revised its guidance on contraceptive use to reflect new evidence that women at high risk of HIV can use any form of reversible contraception, including the progesterone-only injectable, implant and intrauterine devices without an increased risk of HIV infection. Questions considered is, does hormonal contraception increase the risk for HIV acquisition in non-infected women? Does it increase the disease progression in HIV positive women? Does it increase the HIV transmission to non-infected male partners? The new evidence is largely based on the results of the evidence for contraception options and HIV outcomes or the ECHO trial, which was a randomized clinical trial that showed no statistically significant differences in HIV acquisition amongst women using the intramuscular depot medoxyprogesterone acetate, copper IUD or levonorgestrel implant. This new quality, high quality evidence supersedes the low to low moderate quality evidence from observational studies that had been previously used. Some studies suggest that women using progesterone-only injectable contraception may be at increased risk of HIV acquisition. Other studies do not show this association. A WHO expert group reviewed all the available evidence and agreed that the data were not sufficiently conclusive to change current guidance. However, because of the inconclusive nature of the body of evidence on possible increased risk of HIV acquisition, Women using progesterone-only injectable contraception should be strongly advised to also always use condoms, either male or female, and other HIV preventative measures. The role of family planning and the effective use of contraception has been part of the building blocks of the prevention of unintended pregnancies in HIV-positive women. So how can contraceptive use be used in the fight against HIV? By increasing access to family planning services for women with HIV, it can reduce births of children who have a high probability of being infected with HIV. A study of PMTCT programs in 14 countries compared programs that offered the ARV drug nevirapine to women at the time of delivery or nevirapine plus family planning services. By preventing unintended pregnancies with family planning services, the combined family planning nevirapine programs can sharply increase the number of HIV infections averted amongst infants from 39,000 to over 70,000, 70, which could then significantly reduce the number of child deaths. The project, projected number of child deaths averted each year increases from 20,000 to 75,000 when family planning services are added to nevirapine programs. Seven observational studies found no association between hormonal contraceptive use and HIV disease progression. One randomized control trial found increased rates of time to CD4 count to less than 200 and time to CD4 count to less than 200 and mortality amongst hormonal contraceptive users as compared with intrauterine device users. Thank you for listening to my talk and bearing with me. Um, these are my references. Thank you.